Welcome to the Technological Companion for the video lesson titled Selected Techniques for Model Assessment. In this tutorial, we'll explore how to use MATLAB in order to assess the degree to which a binomial distribution is an appropriate model for a data set that is believed to be binomially distributed. We'll also demonstrate how to use hypothesis testing in order to determine if there is sufficient linear correlation structure in a data set to justify fitting a linear regression model to that data set. In addition to the straightforward inferential examples that we've already looked at involving hypothesis testing, hypothesis testing can also be used to assess the degree to which various probabilistic models fit data that they've been trained on. Our first example is going to involve a hypothesis test known as Pearson's goodness of fit test, and we're going to see how it can be used to determine if a binomial distribution with a set of theoretical parameters does an adequate job of fitting a set of data. A game designer believes that a game he is developing will be won approximately 17% of the time. In order to test this belief, he concludes that a binomial distribution with n equals 30 and p equals 0.17 should predict the probability that anyone who plays the game n successive times will win during any x of the 30 plays. The designer releases the game to 50 different participants, and we're going to store that value in the variable called n participants. And he asks each of them to play the game 30 times, representing the n equal 30 trials, and record the number of times they won. The game designer records the frequency of each count of wins that appear in their data set. And the way he's going to do this is he's going to eventually build a, a table that summarizes both the expected and the experimental frequencies, the empirical and the uh, theoretical frequencies of, of wins for both the data set and the distribution. So in order to set up the components of that table, we're going to create a vector called wins that contains all of the possible values of x for this scenario. And since each participant in this study is playing the game 30 times, they can win anywhere from 0 through 30 times. So wins is just going to be an array of the integers starting at 0 and ending at 30. Empirical frequency is the data that's been collected. And in the format that we've got here, what we're seeing is that there were two participants who didn't win the game at all. There were no participants who only won the game once. There were three participants who won the game twice. There were six participants who won the game three times. There were 14 participants who won the game four times, and then so on. And eventually we got to the point where there were no participants who won the game for a sufficiently high number of times, and that's what this trailing range of zeros represents. So each number in this empirical frequency array corresponds to the number of participants there were that won a particular number of wins belonging to the win array. So let's run that block of code. And we're not going to see any output in this section because it's all been suppressed. Well, the next thing that happens is that the game designer computes the theoretical frequencies of observing each value of x by scaling the binomial distribution by the number of observations, or really the number of participants. So they take the binomial PDF function, plug in all of the possible values of x in the form of the wins vector, substitute in the values for n and p, or parameters of the distribution, and then multiply that resulting array by the number of participants. And that's going to give us the expected number of wins for each value of x according to the binomial distribution. And so then finally, we're going to summarize the possible number of wins, the empirical frequencies, or our data, for each value, and then the theoretical frequencies, which we've predicted up here with the binomial distribution for each value. And so if we run this block of code, we'll see that we've got our summary table. There they are. So we can see that there were, as I said, two people in our data set who won never. The, the um, binomial dis distribution 
predicts that on average, out of 50 people, only 0.18677 people will win. No times. Then likewise, we can move down the table and see that, you know, for instance, there were 10 people who won five times. And that agrees pretty well with the binomial distribution's prediction of 9.594 people out of 50 on average winning. So that's what this table does, is it summarizes the number of wins possible, and then for each one of those possible numbers of wins, the empirical and theoretical frequencies, as observed in our data and as predicted by the binomial distribution. Now tables are nice to have, but we'd actually like to do a visual comparison of those empirical and theoretical frequencies, because that's going to give us a pretty visual way because that's going to give us a pretty visual way of assessing how good the binomial model is for our data set. And so all we're going to do is plot a bar graph where the bar heights are represented by the empirical frequencies and the theoretical frequencies, and the horizontal or x-axis is just going to be the values that were in the winds vector, the, the number of possible winds ranging from 0 to 1. So if I run that block of code, we should get a visualization. And there it is. And we can see that the, the blue bar graphs represent our data. Those are the integer empirical frequencies that we've observed. And the orange bars are the theoretical frequencies. And just by taking a purely visual stance of, of assessing our model, these two bar graphs look qualitatively similar. There's certainly some fine scale differences but the overall height and width of this bell-shaped binomial curve looks pretty similar for both graphs. So we could say in a qualitative sense, our models agree pretty well. If we want to d determine the degree to which these models agree on a more quantitative level, though, we are going to perform Pearson's chi-squared goodness of fit test. And to do that, what we need to do is take the empirical and theoretical frequencies that we've already summarized in our table and pool the bins of those tables to ensure that there are at least five empirical observations along with the corresponding theoretical predictions in each of the bins. And if we started with the table itself, I'll scroll back to that, we can see that natively it's not set up that way. So there are only two empirical observations in the bin corresponding to x equals zero. In order to get to where I've got a bin on the left tail of this distribution that has at least five observations in, in it, what I need to do is pool the bins for x equals zero, one, and two, because then I'll have two plus three is five observations. The next bin has six observations. The one after that has 14 then 10, then 8. So those are all good individually. But then what I'll need to do is basically merge all of the remaining bins to get myself the remaining seven observations stuffed into one bin. So bins for x equals 7 all the way down through 30 are going to be merged to one bin. So in order to represent the pooled bins or merged bins and the corresponding numbers of observations, numbers of empirical observations in each of them, I uh, create a set of arrays. So the O array is the number of observations appearing in each of the merged bins. So our first merged set of bins was bins x equals 0, 1, and 2, and there was a total of five observations in them. The next four bins only corresponded to a single x var variable each. So there were six observations in bin 3, there were 14 in bin 4, there were 10 in bin 5, and there were 8 in bin 6. Bins 7 through 30 contained a total of seven observations. So that's what the O array represents, is the number of observations appearing in each of the merged bins. Now I need to have a way of describing the boundaries of all of my merged bins. And I'm creating an array called edges 
where the numbers that I've just highlighted here are going to represent the right endpoints end of the bins that we've described so far. So 2 is the right endpoint of the bin containing the value, bin corresponding to the x values of 0, 1, and 2. Then 3, 4, 5, and 6 formed the right endpoints of, of the bins corresponding to x equals 3, 4, 5, and 6. And the last bin had a right endpoint of x equals 30, because that was the merged set of bins from x equals 7 through 30. Now you might be wondering what this negative 1 is for, and it's mostly for bookkeeping purposes that are going to make the next set of calculations come out right. But you can still think of it as a right endpoint of a merged bin. It's just going to be the merged bin that's just below 0, 1, and 2. So negative 1 be, would be the right endpoint of the bins that are right below that, and it just turns out that those bins have no observations in them. Again, that's just going to be for some bookkeeping, because what I want to do next is create or compute an array that gives me the expected frequencies in each of those merged bins. And the way I can do that is essentially the way I computed the theoretical frequencies in the individual bit bins before, except now I'm going to use a binomial CDF to do it in order to account for the fact that many of my bins are a range of x values instead of just individual x values. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to apply bino CDF to my edges array, and that's going to give me a binomial probability. Well, I'm going to apply it to the edges array from for, for all of those values, for the, for the second through the last values in the edges array. And that's going to calculate the binomial probability that x is equal to each of those values or below it. Now, I don't really have a strong interest in that probability by itself, but if I had multiplied that by the number of participants, then what would happen is that I would calculate the theoretical frequency of the bino given by the binomial distribution of observations that I expect to see for x less than or equal to 2, for x less than or equal to 3, for x less than or equal to 4, less than or equal to 5, less than or equal to 6, or less than or equal to 30. And that's not exactly what I want. What I really want is the theoretical frequencies for 2 and below. For greater than 2, less than or equal to 3. For greater than 4, uh, or for greater than 3, less than or equal to 4. For greater than 4, and less than or equal to 5, and so on. So what I'm going to do is actually subtract two binomial probabilities. The first one that I've already described, the binomial probabilities, the binomial CDFs for these highlighted values. And then I'm going to subtract from those the binomial probabilities for these highlighted values. And that's going to give me the binomial probabilities for each of my merged bins. And so if I take those binomial probabilities for each of my merged bins and then multiply them by the number of participants, or 50 in this case, then I'm going to get the theoretical frequencies, or the expected number of observations, in each of my merged bins. Once I've computed O and E, I can compute the chi-squared test statistic. And that is just the sum of the differences, sum of the squares of the differences of the expected and observed frequencies divided by the expected frequencies. Now, at this point, I would like to determine if that chi-squared test statistic is reasonable. So I want to compare this test statistic to an appropriate chi-squared distribution for my data. Now I have six possible bins of frequencies that were being compared. That was these bins here. These observations co each corresponded to a bin, so there were six of those. But there aren't actually six degrees of freedom. We know that there was a total of 50 observations distributed over those bins. So if I have assigned 
observate a number of observations to any five of my six bins, my knowledge of the fact that there were 50 observations to begin with makes it so that the sixth bin is, is known. It's, it's, it's already going to be, it, it, it's theoretical frequency, or it's observed frequency is going to be written down precisely. So only five of those six observation counts are independent of one another. So that causes us to lose a degree of freedom. So I'm going to calibrate my chi-squared distribution with new equal five degrees of freedom. I can view what the chi-squared distribution is look like, going to look like for that value so that I can compare you know, where my test statistic falls relative to that distribution. And then I can I compute a p-value for that distribution. And we'll run this block of code in order to interpret what all of this means. So my chi-squared test statistic turned out to be 4.8945. If I look at the graph of my corresponding chi-squared distribution, that's right about here, right here just below 5, well within the bulk of the chi, you know, the normal behavior is predicted by this chi-squared distribution. And so if I'm asking myself, what's the probability of observing a chi-squared value that's at or above the one that I've observed, that's this p-value. We see that the p-value comes out to be about 42%, so not at all significant. And in this case, that's a good thing because Pearson's chi-squared goodness of te fit test is trying to determine if a data set seems to be deviating from what the model predicts. So it's actually detecting a poor fit. And what we found is that there's not enough evidence to reject the null hypothesis that the fit is fine and conclude that the fit, fit, fit is probably poor. So we're left with the null hypothesis stating that you know, the fit is adequate for our data set. Another way that we could employ hypothesis testing to assess a fit of a particular model comes into play with linear regression. Now in linear regression you're attempting to fit a linear model to a multi-column data set where you're trying to compare a response variable to multiple input variables and, and you're assuming that there's a linear relationship between the input variables that predicts the output variable. Another way of describing that is that the output variable is linearly correlated with the input variables. If it were not correlated, if you could just look at the data and say that doesn't look very correlated to me, then that would probably be a good hint that it's not worth putting a lot of effort into building a good regression model for that data set. It's just not going to adequately describe the variation in your data. So we can determine that with hypothesis testing, and that's the subject of a technique called nor normal correlation analysis. So the, in an earlier example on regression, we presented a data set that summarized the annual salary and years of service for a sample of employees. The data set just consisted of two columns of numerical observations, the years of experience for the employees and their annual salaries. And we're going to just restate it here by loading it from a, a um, comma-separated value spreadsheet called salarydata.csv. There'll be a link to where you can get that data set as well as this, this MATLAB live script in the description of, of our video. So. I'm reading uh, my data into a MATLAB table from that, that comma-separated value file, and I'm setting some names for the variables in that. So this is going to create a table. Then I'm going to try to build a regression model, and I'm going to do what we've done in the past. I'm going to calculate the coefficient of determination for my regression model, or I'm actually going to just extract it from what MATLAB has already calculated and draw a conclusion from that. So, so far this has got nothing to do with normal correlation analysis. So I'm going to just run this section and see what our results are. So there's our two column data that we can try to build a regression model 
from. I build the model using MATLAB's built-in fit LM for fit linear model, and we see the summaries for it. So our model looks like y equals mx plus b, where y is the salary, x is the years of experience, and so the slope is going to be 9,450, uh, 9, and the y-intercept is going to be 25,792, meaning a kind of a starting salary. So the r-squared statistic or the coefficient of determination for that particular model turned out to be 9.5696 times 10 to the negative 1 or 95 percent and that that's reasonably close to 1 and that's typically you know a metric that we would look at in order to determine if the model that we fit to our data is any good if it's any good at describing most of the variation in my data set. In this case, it was. So this was an example of a model that was, or of a data set that was probably well suited to linear regression. But we could have tried to determine how well suited it was to linear regression beforehand by forming a hypothesis test, by performing normal correlation analysis. So we could ask about the underlying linearity of our data through hypothesis testing. A bad situation we'd like to avoid would be to derive a model that we could expect that our data would be described by a bivariate normal distribution, but with the correlation coefficient parameter taking on a value of zero. Basically, just this, all this means is that our, our data is not linearly correlated, and so we would have no business trying to fit a linear model to it. So in that case, our null hypothesis states that our sample is drawn from a bivariate normal distribution with rho equals zero, where rho is the, the correlation coefficient. There is a way of calculating a sample correlation coefficient from a data set. And there's a formula for it, and we can look it up and, and use it. But it's also, since we've already calculated, it also turns out that it is the signed square root of the coefficient of determination. And by, what I mean by sign is that if the data is positively correlated, so if it it's, it's, looks like it, it varies linearly with a positive slope, then the sample correlation coefficient should be positive. And if it is negatively correlated, the sample correlation coefficient should be negative. As I said, there's a formula that I could use for calculating the correla sample correlation coefficient directly from my data set, but since I've already calculated the coefficient of determination, and I know that salary seems to increase with years of service, years of employment, then I'm pretty comfortable just shortcutting my computation of the sample correlation coefficient by just simply taking the positive square root of the coefficient of determination. In this block of code, n is just the number of rows in my data set, so the number of observations that there are. And then the last line here is the formula for a new statistic that depends on the sample correlation coefficient r, but it does so in a particularly nonlinear way. And it, it just turns out that this this test statistic that I'm calling Z is a standard normal random variable. So you can do hypothesis testing on that standard normal random variable just by using the standard normal distribution. So if I wanted to ask, given the assumption that the null hypothesis is true, in other words, given the assumption that our sample is drawn from a bivariate normal distribution with rho equals zero, how likely is it that we would expect to collect a similarly sized sample from our population that produces a sample correlation coefficient of it that's at least as extreme as the one that we found here. Well, I could apply the normal distribution to my Z statistic that I've computed and I'm testing in the upper range. Let's see what happens. I get a p-value 
of 5.2008 times 10 to the negative 32. It's an exceedingly small probability. So what that's saying is that if my, if my theoretical population that I'm sampling from is truly one in which the years of experience and the salary are totally uncorrelated variables, then it is only going to come out with a probability of 5.2008 times 10 to the negative 32 that I would expect to ever get a data set as correlated as the one that we've got here. So this would be a good indication that it's worth constructing that regression model from my data set. Thank you for watching this technological companion on model assessment. I hope you found it useful and that you will be able to apply the techniques found in this tutorial and the previous ones in this series to your own practice in data analysis and modeling.